Chapter 1, the mechanics of ventilation. So I'm going to introduce or reintroduce the Campbell diagram. Here it is. The Campbell diagram is um, the superimposition of the elastance or compliance curves. Elastance and compliance are inverse of each other, so physiologists tend to use them interchangeably. Uh, so this is the elastance curve for the lungs. This is the elastance curve for the passive chest wall. That is the chest wall with, without any activation of the muscles of inspiration or expiration. It's like chest wall diastole. And the intersection of the two, as you may know, is a functional residual capacity. You can also see that there's a difference in the equilibrium volume. That is, if you were to let, here's the x-axis, this is pleural pressure or I will use interchangeably throughout my talks as intrathoracic pressure. If you were to let pleural pressure reach atmospheric pressure, which is um, on this reference system zero, the lungs will collapse, but not all the way down to a volume. Again, y-axis is volume in percent vital capacity. They will collapse down to a, small, a smaller volume than FRC, but not completely to zero, and that is because the equilibrium volume of the lungs, there is gas trapped within uh, the lungs, and there's always a little bit of a positive volume. And if you were to increase um, intrathoracic pressure above atmospheric pressure, you would simply just collapse the airways, and the volume would not be expelled. Okay, this is FRC, where they intersect. Um, and one last point is the equilibrium volume of the chest wall is up here. It's actually much higher than functional residual capacity. So to get to FRC, the lungs are actually expanded a little, and the chest wall is actually compressed a little. So that means when you're in the operating room and you see the surgeons cut open the sternum to perform uh, bypass surgery or an open heart surgery, you will see what? You'll see the chest wall expand outwards towards its equilibrium volume and you will see the lungs recoil inwards to um, towards its equilibrium volume okay now let's talk about what happens when you want to increase the volume of the thorax say from functional residual capacity to half a vital capacity and for all intents and purposes this is like a normal tidal volume breath in a patient uh, with normal lungs and chest wall while the muscles of inspiration are activated, the pleural pressure will reduce from functional residual capacity to the point along the pulmonary elastance curve that reaches your new higher lung volume. So let's see what this cartoon looks like. Well, you're going to move from here to here, and now your pleural pressure has gone from, say, negative 5 centimeters of water to negative 8 to 10 centimeters of water, and you've increased your uh, thoracic volume to this higher level that is now 50 percent vital capacity. So the pleural pressure is decreased, thoracic volume is increased, and this is an um, po important point which is talked about very extensively in chapter one. This is a pressure change needed only to affect volume change. This um, pressure change says absolutely nothing about gas flow. So it may seem a little artificial, but as you'll see in chapter one, there are two distinct kinds of um, pressure um, when it comes to the mechanics of ventilation. And the first type is a static pressure, and that's the pressure required just to affect a volume. And that's what's illustrated here. Um, this would be like taking a breath in, holding it, and then measuring the pressure that's required to maintain that new volume. It is saying nothing about gas flow. Okay? And what uh, can also be confusing is that You've moved to this new volume here, but the chest wall elastance curve that's depicted here is the passive chest wall elastance curve, essentially a paralyzed or inactive chest wall elastance curve. And it tends to confuse people how you can have this curve illustrated when it's passive, but you're actively changing the volume. And what's really kind of happening here, and this animation isn't completely correct, but during an inspiration, the chest wall elastance curve is actually changing as the muscles of inspiration are activated. The um, compliance curve of the chest wall does change um, and it sort of intersects at this new higher volume and then you would hold it and then on expiration it would then return back to FRC. And the 
slope of this curve doesn't exactly remain like this S shape as it changes during inspiration. It actually becomes a little bit more curvilinear, but this is just for illustrative purposes. Okay. Now it's key that it's the pressure difference between the passive chest wall elastance curve and the pulmonary elastance curve. It's this pressure difference, this lateral difference, remember pressure is on the x-axis here, that represents the amount of pressure that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration to change this volume. Again, this is volume only. This is a static pressure. This is saying nothing about gas flow at this time. Okay, and that's represented, this pressure uh, requirement is represented by this lateral arrow, this orange arrow here. So how does this, how does the Campbell diagram relate to a patient who's mechanically ventilated? Well, there is a relationship, and it and it can be derived from the relative positions of the lung elastance curve and the chest wall elastance curve. So. Recall that under conditions of no airflow, uh, at any given thoracic volume, it's this distance between these two curves that is the pressure that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration to maintain that volume. Again, not talking about gas flow. Well, you could say the exact same thing about the ventilator. If, if the muscles must generate X pressure to maintain a volume, well, then the ventilator must apply the same amount of pressure at the proximal trachea to achieve that and maintain that volume. So now on the x-axis here, instead of intrathoracic pressure, this is now airway pressure that the ventilator is applying to maintain a volume. Okay, so it's a key change in your um, x-axis here. And this is what I just said, that the pressure must be applied by the ventilator to the proximal trachea. So you can kind of make a graph here that at this volume, it's the pressure difference between the lung and the chest wall elastance curve that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration or by the ventilator. So the same amount of pressure applied at the proximal trachea to obtain this volume. So this would be like generating a series of static pressures or a series of plateau pressures for those of you who are familiar with um, ventilatory parlance. Uh, mechanical ventilatory parlance and so you could just graph these out and you can see that this then forms a line of the um, static pressure uh, of the respiratory system okay when I say respiratory system throughout my talks the respiratory system reply uh, the respiratory system implies the lung and the chest wall together so this curve then is a compliance curve of the respiratory system. This would be a series of plateau pressures generated off of the, the ventilator. Okay. Um, so this is the elastance or compliance curve of the respiratory system or the lung and chest wall. And just for a recap, what a static or a plateau pressure is on the ventilator. So if this is Again, airway pressure on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. If you're looking at these pressure-time relationships on a ventilator, you have your peak pressure here. Um, and then what you can do is you can apply an end inspiratory hold when the patient is passive with the ventilator. You hold pressure at the end of inspiration, and then you get this new pressure. This is your plateau pressure, or the static pressure. This is, again, you've removed airflow from the equation, and you are assessing the amount of pressure that must be applied at the proximal trachea just to maintain a volume. And that's essentially what we just saw in the last slide, the amount of pressure um, to attain a given volume of the respiratory system. And the respiratory system, again, when you're ventilated, includes the lung and the chest wall together. This is your static pressure. Um, so this, the static pressure is the pressure required to maintain a thoracic volume in the absence of airflow. It's therefore related to the compliance of the respiratory system. And just um, for interest's sake, the slope of this line from onset of inspiration to the pressure here, the static pressure, this slope, interestingly enough, uh, approximate the com approximates the compliance of the respiratory system. Okay, so what what's the difference between um, plateau pressure, pleural pressure, and peak pressure? 
well, this graph will um, help uh, illuminate these differences. Okay, so the compliance curve of the chest wall approximates um, the pleural pressure uh, or the intrathoracic pressure in a patient who is um, sedated and, and maybe paralyzed. So there's absolutely no um, there's absolutely no contribution from the muscles of inspiration at all. So the pleural pressure follows the chest wall elastance curve. And this is a key point here. And you can sort of think of why that would be. In a patient who's, who's heavily sedated and paralyzed on the ventilator, the ventilator is pushing air into the proximal trachea. That proximal trachea is, or that pressure is then used to expand the lungs. And then the lungs are pressing out against the chest wall. And it's that compression of the lungs against the chest wall that determines your pleural pressure. Okay? And the pleural, so the pleural pressure will be determined largely by the, um, the chest wall elastance curve here. So if you were to obtain a plateau pressure in this particular patient, the static pressure of the respiratory system would fall on this curve here. This is the respiratory system elastance curve. It would fall here, okay? At this volume, the pleural pressure would actually be here. This would be the pleural pressure about here because it's following the chest wall elastance curve. And then this additional curve to the right here, this is the dynamic aspect of, inch, of, of airway pressure that the ventilator must overcome for airways resistance. So that would define your peak pressure. So again, there's the approximate pleural pressure at this volume. And then if you had a patient with increased airways resistance, their peak pressure would fall out here. So you, this is a key point that you must understand the difference between uh, the peak pressure, the plateau pressure, and the pleural pressure. They can be very different, and there tends to be this assumption or this misunderstanding amongst you know, a lot of the house staff who I meet that, that the pressure that you're pulling off of the, or you're measuring off of the ventilator at the proximal trachea somehow is equivalent to the pleural pressure, and it's not at all. Um, the pressure uh, at the proximal trachea will be um, variably transmitted to the pleural space, and that will be dependent upon um, the relative compliances of the lung and the chest wall together. So that's the overview of Chapter 1, and uh, if you're interested, I strongly suggest that you tune in for the introduction for all of my other chapters, because you are going to love them. So ARDS on the right ventricle, there's been conflicting results regarding the effect of positive pressure on right ventricular size and function in ARDS, and I think that this can be accounted for by this nice distinction that was given by Luciano Gat Gattinoni and colleagues in the late 90s, and this is um, an often overlooked article in the Blue Journal. And they propose this really kind of neat distinction between pulmonary ARDS and extrapulmonary ARDS. In both states, there's a big reduction in the compliance of the respiratory system leading to high peak and plateau pressures that you measure with the ventilator, the proximal trachea. But in pulmonary ARDS, the abnormality is impaired pulmonary compliance. And this, these patients were primarily direct toxic insults to the, to the lungs, classically an aspiration pneumonia or a bad pneumonia that's, that's, that's blossomed into, into ARDS physiology. And it's um, typified by um, consolidations that can't really be recruited. Um, and uh, this results in, in very high transpulmonary pressures as, as less of the airway pressure is transmitted to the pleural space. And I have a cartoon in a couple of slides that I think might better illustrate this. Um, in these patients, lung volume will not change greatly. The elevated transpulmonary pressure is thought to increase the right ventricular afterload. So if you sort of think of the pressure inside the alveolus less the pressure in the pleural space, that's the distending pressure of the lungs. And that's also the pressure that the alveolar capillaries feel. So as at the point at which the transpulmonary pressure supersedes the transmural pressure of the pulmonary arterioles, 
So if you think of the distending pressure of the pulmonary arterial versus the distending pressure of the lung tissue around it, once the transpulmonary pressure supersedes the transmural pressure of the pulmonary arterial, then the blood vessel will collapse and that will increase vascular resistance and it will therefore increase right ventricular afterload. And then by contrast, they described this extra pulmonary ARDS, which similarly resulted in poor respiratory system compliance. And when I say respiratory system, I'm referring to the lungs and the thorax together. Um, but the primary problem for the, the primary driver of the decrease in respiratory system compliance was the drop in thoracic compliance. And they didn't really get into the pathophysiology of this, but um, it was thought to be due to it tracked nicely with increased intra-abdominal pressure. So a lot of these uh, ARDS patients were, were uh, the ARDS was the result of, you know, trauma, pancreatitis, abdominal sepsis, these insults that are occurring outside of the lung but affecting, affecting the lungs by proxy. And these patients tended to have more atelectasis and edema that could be recruited with positive pressure. But nevertheless, they're still um, very poor. Uh, chest wall compliance. Um, the reduction in chest wall compliance when you apply pleural pressure while it, while it, it increases plateau pressures, um, it, the, there's a great increase in the pleural pressure, not in the transpulmonary pressure. And it's the pleural pressure that you can sort of think of that affects cardiac loading, pre cardiac preload. As the juxtacardiac, this juxtacardiac just means the pressure around the heart, as the pressure, as the pleural pressure goes up, it affects the juxtacardiac pleural pressure, which affects the pericardial pressure, and that tends to um, change a biventricular loading condition. So if you can imagine an increase in pleural pressure, there would be more of a preload reducing effect. So this is my little cartoon. So this is my hokey ventilator, and you're, we're going to administer a fixed volume to all three of these situations. So this is the nor this is the balloon in the box analogy. So this is a normal lung compliance and a normal, this box is the chest wall compliance. So this is the normal respiratory system compliance. So this is, you could say this is extra pulmonary ARDS. This is a poor chest wall compliance. This is, or you could say tense ascites or, or severe obesity, anything that's going to drop the uh, thoracic compliance, but preserve pulmonary compliance here. This is the low chest wall compliance. And then this is the pulmonary ARDS. This is the direct toxicity to the lungs where pulmonary compliance is really reduced, but chest wall compliance is normal. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to administer the same volume to each of these um, patients. So what's going to happen in the normal patient? Well, the lung is going to increase the balloon, and it's going to push out. Again, these patients are all heavily sedated and potentially paralyzed, so that they're not making any inspiratory efforts, so they are not confounding changes in intrathoracic pressure and volume. So watch that again. So you're going to give, give the, this patient a breath. The lung is going to expand and push out against the chest wall, and it's the pressing of the lung out against the chest wall that determines the pleural pressure or the intrathoracic pressure. That's the pressure between the inside of the lung or the alveolus and the chest wall. That's the pleural pressure. That's the pressure that the ventricles feel uh, in terms of their preload. Okay? The transpulmonary pressure is the difference in pressure between the inside of the alveolus or the lung and the pleural pressure. Okay? So what's going to happen to this patient here? Well, the lung is going to press, is going to increase in volume because of its, on, as a function of its normal compliance, but as it starts to press out against this very stiff, non-distensible chest wall, you can imagine that the intrathoracic pressure, the pleural pressure, is going to increase to a much greater extent than the patient with the normal lung and chest wall compliance. Well, let's look at the patient with pulmonary ARDS, with very poor pulmonary compliance. You're going to give them the same volume, but there's going to be much less of a volume, or, or, there will be much less of a volume change, and there'll be much less of an intrathoracic pressure change. But you can imagine that the pressure inside the alveolus compared to the intrathoracic pressure is going to be much greater because of this poorly non-distensible lung. So in this patient, there'll be a very high plateau pressure, a very high driving pressure, but a high intrathoracic pressure, or pleural pressure. In this patient, there'll also be a very high driving pressure or plateau pressure, but that's going to be mostly this high transpulmonary pressure uh, 
And as I mentioned, it's that transpulmonary pressure that causes collapse of the, of the alveolar vessels, and that actually tends to afterload the RV. So this extra pulmonary ARDS, I think you could imagine, would tend to reduce the preload of the RV, whereas this would tend to increase the afterload of the RV, and this is the distinction here. So if we want to think of it in terms of the Campbell and Guyton analyses, this is pulmonary ARDS. Remember, going back to chapter one, this is kind of my modified Campbell diagram. This is pulmonary compliance. This is chest resting chest wall compliance. This is where they meet at functional residual capacity. The x-axis is pleural or airway pressure. It's airway pressure when you consider the um, compliance of the respiratory system together. So this is the pressure that is applied at the proximal trachea to affect a given volume and the slope of this curve affects, reflects, I should say, the relative compliances of the lung and chest wall together. Um, and I'll illustrate that here. So if you imagine a significant decrease in pulmonary compliance, so this would be pulmonary ARDS, that's the, the, the non-distensible lung, FRC drops. And now, it's the la for each volume here, it's the lateral distance, it's this, again, this is pressure on the x-axis. It's this lateral distance, this is the pressure that must be generated by the muscles of respiration to generate a given volume on the y-axis. In a patient who is, you know, heavily sedated and, and potentially paralyzed, this pressure then becomes the amount of pressure that the ventilator must apply at the proximal trachea, or the airway pressure, to determine, to, or to achieve each of these volumes. So then if you were to plot each of these pressures that you must apply at the airway to achieve each of these given volumes along the z-axis, well then you can see that the respiratory system compliance drops. And so essentially these are just serial plateau pressures from the ventilator. The curve shifts down and to the right, so then for, for a, a given plateau pressure, for a given volume, the plateau pressure is greater. Okay. As I mentioned, this is the plateau pressure. But as I talked about in the previous slide, or sort of implied it, I guess, the pleural pressure in the heavily sedated and potentially paralyzed patient, the pleural pressure follows the chest wall compliance curve, or the chest wall elastance curve. And you can sort of picture it as the lung pressing out against this paralyzed chest wall. If the chest wall compliance is fairly normal, then as the lung volume increases and it pushes out against this chest wall, it's the determination of the of the of the two coming together that makes your um, your intrathoracic or pleural pressure and that's the pleural pressure here and this is the airway or plateau pressure here so really it's this lateral distance between the pleural pressure and the plateau pressure this is your transpulmonary pressure so this is kind of like your right right ventricular afterload here and this is your right ventricular preload determination here your intrathoracic or pleural pressure so really in the, in the heavily sedated and potentially paralyzed patient, um, the determ the, what determines intrathoracic pressure is in the numerator it's tidal volume, and that's gonna you know that's gonna be what essentially you dial into the ventilator in a volume limited mode of, of ventilation uh, over the chest wall compliance in the denominator. So in, in this patient, when the drop in the thoracic compliance, or the thoracic compliance is synonymous with respiratory system compliance, is due to a drop in the lung compliance, um, less of the airway pressure, so this is the airway pressure, is transmitted to the intrathoracic space. And in contrast to extrapulmonary ARDS, this is a significant drop in chest wall compliance. So follow the chest wall elastance curve, the resting chest wall compliance. Elastance and compliance are inversely related, so sometimes I use them interchangeably. So there's a drop in your chest wall compliance, again FRC drops. And similarly, the drop in chest wall compliance increases the lateral distance between the two lung and chest wall curve for any given volume. And again, in the spontaneously breathing patient, this is the amount of pressure that must be generated by the muscles of respiration. Or in the ventilated patient, this is the amount of pressure that must be applied to the proximal trachea to achieve this given volume. So again, if you were to plot these out, you'll see that the respiratory system compliance, just like pulmonary ARDS, is also reduced. The, the airway 
pressure to volume curve is shifted down into the right. But it's not because of the decrease in pulmonary compliance, it's decrease in chest wall compliance. This is the extra pulmonary ARDS. And you can see that while P, the plateau pressure is going to be high, your intrathoracic or pleural pressure is going to be much higher. So this is that balloon pushing out against the stiff box. And the lateral distance for this given volume between your plateau pressure and your, and your pleural pressure here, this is your transpulmonary pressure, and you can see it's much less. The transpulmonary pressure or the right ventricular afterload is much less for extrapulmonary ARDS compared to pulmonary ARDS. And this may explain why, as we'll see, um, the higher intrathoracic pressure has more of a preload effect on the RV and less of an afterload effect.